My daughter was an infant, and I would be sitting at my desk writing um, at my computer, and then I would, with my left foot, I would be rocking her as I wrote. <laughs> now that's discipline. <laughs> I think the same thing with like the black comics that were not on the show, they were so hungry that uh, when they get the time to shine. Um, yeah, so I would just think I was in the right place at the right time. I don't think I was no different than any other comic and people just liked uh, what uh, my style of comedy, you know, stuff. So, plus I paid off a lot of people. Does that work? Is that what you want me to say? You want me to admit that on, on camera? Hi, I'm Tim Slego. Welcome to Stand Up, Sit Down. The film is Laugh to Your Winded. The host is with me here tonight. Uh, director, writer of the documentary on Chicago comedy, the ultimate documentary on Chicago comedy, Michael Alexander is with me today. Thanks for having me, Tim. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, you started this documentary when? When was this? Uh, when did you start filming Chicago Comics? Can we rewind for a moment? So, by ultimate, you mean the only one? <laughs> because if it's the only one of anything, it will be the ultimate one. <laughs> but, uh, I started. I started shooting it. Uh, I don't. I think um, before I had some gray hair. Honestly, <laughs> it's, it's like a really low-level ghetto kind of a president of the United States situation where I just aged so many years after I got through that, that documentary. <laughs> I'm not finished with the documentary, but I think I started shooting it in 2015 or 16. I, I don't even recall, but um, it, was, it was a really, really large project. It was the biggest thing I've ever done easily in my career. And so it took a lot of documentaries. Some people work in documentaries from what I've heard. Anywhere between three and five years. I've there's a documentary in stand up a comedy in Chicago by a New York comic. I forgot the name of the doc, but I know she spent seven or eight years filming that documentary. So they just kind of take a lot out of you, and they they take a long time. I have to move closer to the mic. <laughs> I'm instructed to do so. I I didn't know. I didn't know what that signal meant. At actually. home, I don't. <laughs> at home, I don't have people. <laughs> so. <laughs> So how, how, how long have you been in the Chicago comedy scene? You, uh, you, you started in the early days back in... Uh, 87. Wow. Hey, oh, did I say 87? Oh, you know, it's really funny. I get confused. That's when I auditioned for Zanies. I started in 85, May of 85, middle of May of 85. Uh-huh. And uh, I believe that was at the Comedy Cottage. It was at the Comedy Cottage. In, in, in Rosemont. Is... Uh, uh, what was explain a little? I, I think Larry touched on the comedy cottage a little bit when he was here. Um, what was what was that like? What was the room like? I I heard by the time I did it, it was kind of like a, a friend of mine once talked about uh, the cheerleader you always wanted to date in in high school. And by the time you actually uh, you, your turn comes up, she's now in her forties, overweight, got six kids, four dads. <laughs> it's just not it's not the dream that you had in high school. And yeah. it's well, by the time I came to the comedy cottage, it was. Uh, I think it was called the last laugh then, and it was on the last laugh at that point. But you, you were there when it when it was peaking, right? Yeah, yeah. I was I was there when it had high hopes for the future. And, um, <laughs> thought that maybe it would marry a doctor or something. But, uh, <laughs> so I was there during the heyday. And um, interesting uh, enough, when I started, I got hired there after eight months of performing. So that's the club that I got hired at. Um, first, and I got hired on the day that they closed down. Like they had this big party, they cut up the stage. It was a new talent night, and I was the only one allowed to go up, which makes me feel special. And they just let me go up only, no other new talents, and they let me perform. And then that was it, and I got hired that day. And I think that day I received a free seven up. <laughs> wow. To, cel to celebrate that I was a professional. <laughs> Then shortly, then after that, you started. You were working regular around the comedy scene. Did you did you do the road a lot? Were you? Uh... 
I did do the road. I really tried to avoid it. I always got homesick. You know, I uh, I had a girlfriend that I lived with at the time, and then I was married, and ended up having um, a daughter. And so I, you know, I just in, in that in that order, not all at once. No, not all at once. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not on one of those uh, programs on cable where you just you meet someone, they need a husband, <laughs> and everything just happens all at once. Mm-hmm. I'm all about progression. So, uh, <laughs> so, so, so you worked at Zanies. You were a regular at Zanies. Yes, but not like you, Tim. <laughs> I don't know if the audience understands that you and Larry and, and select few even and, and Anthony uh, Griffith um, where Zany's acts where they were you're not allowed to work anywhere else because they, they coveted you guys that much that they didn't want any of the other clubs to have you and I was not one of those guys but uh, you were Tim <laughs> and did you notice that every time you work with me you came out and you had a flat tire that was that was envy. <laughs> Not a slow leak. <laughs> I uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 I was n- now. Now any club can ha- club can have me. I'm I'm now the cheerleader. <laughs> <laughs> the old bitter cheerleader. Just kidding. <laughs> and then uh, uh, you also for a stint, you also wrote for Arsenio Hall. Is that is that correct? Yeah, I was a staff writer for a brief. Brief time, and then I was a freelance writer on his last show, in the show in 2015. Interesting enough, I got more stuff on freelance than I did on staff. More, more money. Jokes on jokes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, he he did more of your jokes. Yeah, yeah. On freelance. Uh-huh. Did you know Arsenio when he was when he was uh, still in Chicago? No, he had left Chicago when I started. I'm not sure. I mean, I'd imagine. I think he left like. 82 or something in between 80 and 82 I'd heard mm-hmm. when Nancy Wilson discovered him so yeah it was it was before me and uh, a lot of the a lot of the characters that were a lot of the interviews you made in the uh, in, in the documentary uh, were comics that you probably worked with at uh, at uh, the through Chicago actually I know I know Paul Gamartin I know that he was uh, we have his clip coming up Anthony Griffith of course uh, um, Jimmy Pardall Jim yeah yeah, I mean, a lot of the fun part, honestly, was that it was like sort of like um, Greg Liana, the director, we both know him. He wrote Meet the Parents. He watched the film and he thought it was a great like walk down memory lane for him. And for me, it the funnest part about shooting the film was getting to see all the comedians that, you know, I haven't seen in forever, especially the ones that were based in Los Angeles now. And. But I did have to be introduced to quite a few uh, comedians that um, I never worked with, like, say, Dion Cole or Lil Rail, um, you know, comedians that came along um, later on, and then also comedians who might have worked different circuits that I didn't work. So. And it's uh, the, the film, the, the film what did premiere, right? The, you did have a premiere? Yeah, it premiered at, at Zany's in uh, November, I think it was November 4th, um, 19, what is it? oh, 2018. Uh, now it's now it's uh, now it's being recut. Yeah, well, between then and now, it's just been a video file at the very left top corner of my computer screen. But, uh, <laughs> it's been next. You've got to have a yeah. very exclusive it's, password to yeah, stream it's it. Been, it's, been, it's been right above a uh, link to an Amazon product that I'll never buy. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's the significance that it's had for me up until this point. No, what it really comes down to is that the premiere went great. And there are a lot of people who really like the film a lot, still like the film a lot. Um, I didn't like the cut. Um, I, I, you know, first time filmmaker, and I didn't really know how to really assert myself um, about what I might like and stuff like that. The editors that I used, they were they were great guys, to be perfectly honest. But you know, they were dealing with someone who was untrained. So I'm really uh, an anal person about whatever work that I put out, whatever joke I write. I take pride in it. So I didn't try to shop it, even though now um, I am in talks with a couple of different um, distribu- just distributors who are interested in it and a project on a whole, because I shot well over 100 hours with well over 100 different uh, um, subjects, writers, comedians, and um, producers, and you know, club owners. So there's just so much that can be done with the footage. Uh-huh. So it's now, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be a series? How many, how, uh, Four part, five part. Yeah, right now it's going to be a four part uh, series dealing with um, things like race. I think one of them because it's still 
haven't made a definitive decision. One of them will be about writers and producers because there's so many great writers and producers that have come out of Chicago stand-up. Um, and I like the idea of cutting it um, into uh, pieces like that because you know you won't get bored with watching it. It's easier to focus when you have like 22 minutes on one particular topic as opposed to trying to, you know, one of the things that I did do that and I, I quite frankly wouldn't do again is I was trying to please everyone. I was trying to include, you know, Say every gender, every every you know, every race, um, every club, every you know, you know, uh, as many comedians as I could possibly uh, um, please. And you just, if you do that, you just don't have as much focus as you should. And will, will the title be the same? Laugh to your winded. Yeah, I thought about changing the title, but honestly, it has a web presence that's been out there for a while, and so I just figured I'd just keep it the same. And uh, we'll talk more about that uh, after this break. Yeah, the, the uh, naming yourself after a, a disaster. A uh, winning disaster. Yeah. <laughs> I remember when I first noticed that there were some comics in there, right? They were all like named after like FEMA <laughs> shit. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> you will remember them, there's no doubt about it. Give yeah. it up for FEMA. <laughs> <laughs> Name yourself FEMA. What? <laughs> Hi, I'm Tim Slagle. Welcome back to Stand Up Sit Down. Uh, that, of course, was Dion Cole doing talking about uh, a people named FEMA. <laughs> the movie is Laugh Till You're Winded. It's a, a very funny movie full of very funny people and the very funny director, writer, producer, everything with that film. With me, again, Michael Alexander. Yes, I'm still here. Uh... <laughs> Somebody might have just flipped through the stations and didn't get it. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, you, uh, uh, you made that documentary we talked about in that first segment, but you, but you are currently working on another documentary you, that, you, that you told me about. This will be your second project. Yes, I am um, working on a documentary, uh, working title, Brew, B-R-U. And that is uh, it's a film about my father, who was a prominent uh, attorney and civil rights activist in Evanston, Illinois. Um, and he, he succumbed to uh, drug addiction, unfortunately. But um, he was like this amazing attorney. He went to Northwestern Law School and Northwestern undergrad um, in the 70s. There were very few, I mean, in, yeah, the 60s, actually. There were very few black students that were at Northwestern at that time. But the film is going to mostly center around um, a dispute that he had with the Evanston Police Department where he became one of the youngest aldermen in Evanston at 28 at 28 years old, and at that point, then police started targeting him, and there was a lot of racial issues, incidents going on with the Evanston Police Department and the minorities in Evanston, and the minorities, like I'm not one of them, <laughs> <laughs> and minorities in Evanston, and um, so they harassed him on two occasions. One occasion, they put him in a hospital, and there's actually, there's numerous articles about my father the most uh, famous article would be titled Up in Smoke. It's a Chicago Tribune uh, article about him that's very detailed, heartbreaking, but um, it's kind of a, a cautionary tale, his story. But he sued the Evanston Police Department, and he won. And it led to towards a citizen's review board over the police, something that he had been seeking for years. Wow. So it's going to center mostly around that, but obviously I can't ignore um, the drug um drug addiction that he um, that he succumbed to. Sure. And it's a story you've wanted to tell for a while. Yeah, uh, 20 you... years. Wow. When he was alive, he died like eight years ago, and I've always wanted to tell this story. Even before he died? Yes, even before he died. Yeah. Did normally people want to do it after they die? <laughs> <laughs> well, no. No, no, no. You, you know, it, it's... It's a documentary, you know. Maybe you maybe you wanted to write a book. Maybe you wanted, you know. There, there's other things you could have done. It's but you did want to do a documentary on your dad. You've 20 never years. seen maybe my set list before because if you did, you know that my handwriting would show you that there's no way I'm that type of a writer <laughs> <laughs> just by looking at my set list. What it, what is your, what is your philosophy for writing jokes? Do you do you, uh, I've asked everyone. Do you, do you carry a notebook around with you or do you? When I was performing, because I no longer perform, um, I I did force myself to write um, 
there are some great comedians like Paul Gilmartin and Carla Felicia, who's a comedian from Chicago, right. who's a, an amazing writer. Um, they really taught me to be disciplined. Carla um, told me that I should write out of the newspaper and I should start writing topical material. And because I did that, it led towards me writing for George Lopez's act and then writing stuff that uh, Leno performed on The Tonight Show, Freelance, and in the Arsenio Hall, as well as other comedians locally even that I've written for. So... Um, it's just about discipline and um, forcing yourself to sit in the right stream of consciousness if necessary, if there's no premise that you have on hand. Um, I'm very, like I'm a stickler about joke construction. I'm a big believer in using, um, um, utilizing as few words as possible in a joke, in a setup and in a punchline because the leaner the joke is, I think the bigger the payoff you get. So. Yeah, well, I think, yeah, I think probably the shortest joke ever is probably take my wife, please. Exactly. <laughs> it's uh, exactly. Or four hus- words. Or husband, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or birthing person or, <laughs> right. or whatever, what, whatever you choose with your pronouns, I guess yeah. it is uh, 2021. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, it, it, it's the, the, the fewer words that you can do to get to the punchline is, is, is always, you know, that's, that's, that I think is the key to joke writing. But is that, that is how you would do it? You would have a notebook on one side and a, a newspaper on the other? Yeah, I mean, just... I, I would, I would, at, I, I didn't, by the time I started writing um, topical material, then, you know, everyone was starting to use computers, you know, pers- PCs were starting to become more popular with comedians and stuff. So usually it would be a, a, a computer. But, um, yeah, I would... And, a, re- and a newspaper. So and a, and a newspaper. <laughs> rather, rather than two browser windows. I remember my, my ex-wife, Mary, and you probably remember her because she used to go yeah. to shows with me. I was with her a long time and mother of my child. And so she... Um, I remember um, when my daughter was about to be born, right before that for my birthday, she uh, got me a subscription to the USA Today. And that, that was like the Bible for me, you know, when it came to being able to get a, a ref, source reference yeah. and, and things of that sort. And so I would just use read that paper every day. I would pick out whatever is the most fertile topics that I could write about. And I would just write, 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 write all day long. And I remember um, that I used to, my daughter was an infant, and I would be sitting at my desk writing um, at my computer. And then I would, with my left foot, I would be rocking her. As I wrote. Now that's discipline. <laughs> and multitasking. Yeah. Maybe not so great of a father, but as a comedian and a writer, that's some discipline. Your me. daughter's doing quite well in New York, yes? I, I, am I wrong? Yeah, she's doing great. She uh, was recently in a national uh, commercial for Crest, and she has a big thing coming up that I'm not allowed to talk about, but I will be allowed to talk about very soon. Oh, cool. But really big. Cool. It's uh, so. So you have not. You said you have not done stand up in nine years. Is that what you? Or did yeah, I stopped doing stand up for nine years. Oh, you stopped it for nine years, yeah. right? But you also said that you're not doing it anymore. Yeah, I don't currently perform. No, no. I came back and I performed for um, a number of years, and I really probably have not even been on stage, um, um, other than doing some shows here and there. I mean, I'll, I'll do some shows every once in a while for money. But in general, um, I, I just don't perform anymore. I don't have the same love that I had. And I had so much time off of stand-up, it is not like riding a bike. You already know that. You probably hate having a month off without shows. Yeah. Or and can you imagine having a decade off? And it just when I came back to stand-up, I just was not the same comedian. Hmm. And no interest, on, no interest in picking it up? And No, no, not anymore now at this point. I, I just... I rather, you know, concentrate on, um, you know, uh, maybe producing some things, whether they end up on streaming services, whether they end up um, um, me either uh, selling them or, or um, having them just stream on my website. Um, as long as I'm just producing things, it's, it's more interesting to, for me than it is to uh, to perform. You're still great. I've seen, <laughs> I've seen you. No, I've seen you, and you haven't lost it. You uh, lost it. And you know what? I'm not kissing your butt, but you were one of the most cere- cerebral comedians that I that I work with back in the day. I mean, just all your stuff, which is so smart, and quite quite a bit of it over my head, to be honest. 
<laughs> and, yeah, and, mo- and most of the audience. Yeah, you thought, you thought I was just not paying attention to you because I didn't like you. And it was just that I wasn't smart enough. <laughs> I, uh, so so why so so you you took nine years off, went back, and then just kind of drifted away. Why why what was the nine years? What what started that? Was there? Well, I'm open about this, but um, I suffer from bipolar um, disorder, and so I just was dealing with a lot of issues and problems that I had, and it just really derailed my career. Quite frankly, killed my stand-up career. So, so I was just dealing with those things. It's uh, you know, obviously, mental illness is something that's been talked about of late, but uh, it's just a very misunderstood um, disease. Sure, sure. So, so you burn some bridges? Is that what uh, is that what I'm getting? Well, uh, I burn them healthy, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> as well, but yeah, <laughs> yes, I torched a few bridges or so. Right? How about this? There was a lot of helicopter action. <laughs> it's one of my favorite episodes of The Simpsons where Homer, as he after he quits uh, the nuke plant to uh, uh, work in a bowling alley, as he's riding out in a golf cart playing bongos on uh, Mr. Burns' head, he literally <laughs> takes a Molotov cocktail and throws it out the back that hits the bridge as he goes over <laughs> on the way yeah, out. See, his was on purpose. My, was my personality. <laughs> well... I've, uh, I've I've burned a few in my day too, and uh, depending on how, uh, how how long this show goes on, <laughs> <laughs> they might actually leak out eventually, and uh, uh, that. That pretty much wraps it up for the broadcast version of uh, uh, the interview with Michael Alexander. Thank you for coming in, Michael. Thanks for sharing your clips with us. Thank you for having me. Oh, my pleasure. For for those of you uh, who are watching online or on the podcast, uh, we have a very special clip with Paul Gilmartin coming up after the break. Uh, and uh, we will take off the, uh, take off the, 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 the filters. So uh, uh, good night if you're watching at home. If you're on the podcast, see you in a bit. First time I ever met Paul, I was on a show with Paul and didn't know who Paul was. And I was booked by Joni Byford and I was the closer. And Paul was the feature and he smoked me off the stage. Goddamn right I did. Burned me off That's the stage. Right. And I was like, and I took notice. And did then you? I didn't know who the yes. hell Paul Gilmartin Fucking is. Fucking right. Didn't know it to that point. That's right. I went, and, in the, I went yeah. out in the parking lot and jerked off. <laughs> <laughs> and welcome back to Stand Up Sit Down. I'm Tim Slagle. I'm here with Michael Alexander. This is uh, for those of you who are watching online or are listening on the podcast. Uh, this is, our, this is our bonus segment. That was Paul Gilmartin uh, talking about Joni Byford's club in Berwyn, Illinois, if I remember it right. That, uh, uh, and yeah. Wait, you, yeah. you still bitter? I don't know. You're, you're about making... Paul? No, no. <laughs> I was cocky, and then I deserved it, quite frankly. And, and I went up there, and, and uh, I just couldn't. It was like a tornado. <laughs> it was like following. It literally was like, because it was that. And then also I'd never seen Paul before. And so it's just like seeing this brand new comic who you, you looked at him, you knew he's going to be someone and having to follow him and, and not be prepared for it. And at Wackos, you know, that was the kind of club where, you know, following violence is what you worried about. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, was, yeah. uh, that was one of the strangest rooms. I had never... I, I, I don't think I ever played to more than 10 people in that room. Uh, and, and yet it, 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 it was stayed open for three, four years at least. Yeah, I, I think that club might have been open for at least five years. You know, I interviewed the owner of that club. I couldn't get one for, with Joni. I couldn't get... Yeah, I couldn't uh, uh, nail it down with her, but um, I, I got one um, that I didn't use yet, at least, with Steve, the owner of Wackos, who would... Uh, and, and Steve, if you're listening, it just this is just in jest, but truthful. Um, he would make you wait to get your money, no matter what position you were on the show. So <laughs> say if your feature, the benefit of the feature is getting to leave, you know. Uh-huh. Right yeah. Side. But he would make you wait till like two hours after the show, like for every act. Huh. And then we, if they were going to pay you, then if it was literally half a person, like if it was like that, 
even if it was like that scene in Breaking Bad where Gus gets cut in half, remember, from the explosion, <laughs> you'd have to do a, a, a show for the half of Gus that was still breathing. <laughs> That's what you would have to do at Wackos. <laughs> So. Oh, yeah. yeah, and if you are watching, Steve, you still owe me money. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I, I think I was there like the last week or, or something like that. I can't remember the details. And uh, 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 Joni said, well, we don't, I don't have the money. And, uh, but, you know, I'll get it to you next week. And I, I must have called Joni every month for two years, <laughs> at least, wondering, am I ever going to see that? And she'd always have, a, she, she, she'd always tell me, oh, yeah, that we, we have a lawsuit, and don't worry, we'll get. Uh... <laughs> I don't have the money is like something you would hear during a really bad drug deal. <laughs> Doesn't sound like that you would have that in regular business. I don't have the money. Tim Allen once told me, he said that there, there's only two businesses in the world where you get paid uh, a lump of cash with a rubber band around it. And that's that's drug dealing in comedy. In stand-up. It's sometimes <laughs> synonymous. But yeah. <laughs> he said he said someday, he goes, someday when I play arenas, I'm gonna ask for my money to be in a briefcase just full of full of bills with rubber <laughs> bands around. Just to see what that feels like when you open it up and just see all that money stacked in there and the uh, That would be great. And right off to the gentleman's club. <laughs> and by gentlemen, I mean guys who play squash. <laughs> uh, Chicago, yeah, Chicago was uh, was really interesting in those days. It's it, I can't remember how many clubs we had. It, it's I sat down with another comic and we tried to count them. I thought we counted like seventy we, we, full weeks. Uh, of work within the two-hour drive of Chicago. Does that sound? Does that sound a little? Re- is my uh, senior citizen memory failing me? I'm not sure if it's that much. It might be. Well, you got booked more than me, obviously. But it, 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 thank you. <laughs> this is doing a lot for my ego here, Tim. But uh, there was a ton of work. That's all I know. I know, like within, I know within, like say maybe a half hour to 40 minutes. That I had counted 20. Two to twenty-four different venues that yeah. you could get paid doing stand-up. So that's pretty good. Yeah, there Far was Far Cry a, from seventies. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, but then, but then, you know, when you when you talk about two hours, you're adding in Milwaukee, yeah. Rockford, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Joliet, uh, uh, Peoria. But it's what it's what also helped kill the business: the oversaturation of clubs, all the comedian. I mean, because all these clubs need talent. Right. And so yeah. they have to hire people who aren't ready and and people get sick of seeing stand up, you know, and you already know that the saturation of stand up um, and television. Paul Martin talks about it in my film. There was so much um, stand up on TV. Fox had two different stand up shows. Fox TV, two. So it, it just got to be too much. Stand up should be and in, in, in was kind of underground, you know, and it yeah. just became so commercial. I say, I, th- I still think it's that way. I think those, some of the best rooms are in basements. Is that if you have to go downstairs to go into a comedy club, it's probably going to be a good room. Yeah, 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 probably. Well, I've been to a really bad one nighter. <laughs> that, was, uh, that was like literally some dude's basement. But yeah, but yeah, you're right about that though. It should be kind of like a CD. Look, Zanies is an amazing A club. Zanies has always been an A club. I consider Zanies my home club, and um, and Bird House over the years has helped me a lot. He's helped a lot of comedians a lot. I wanted to give him a shout out in Zanies because Zanies, the Laugh Factory here, um, 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 and, and um, Jamie Masada, um, owner of the Laugh Factories, and um, and the manager Curtis at the Laugh Factory here, just a lot of different people gave me a lot of access to be able to shoot my film. I wouldn't have been able to shoot it without the help of. Um, uh, all of these uh, club owners and, um, and and club managers. Um, I think you know it's it's a pretty good community in stand up. It's like any other business, you know. It can be a sibling rivalry and you know and things of that sort. But I think, um, I think oh, it's the worst. Comedy is the worst. Yeah. It, it, the, the the hardest 
group to play in front of is a group full of comics. Like when you're doing a showcase or something and the entire audience is made up with comics, that's making another comic laugh is nearly impossible. The best you're going to get from a comic is, uh, oh, that's a good bit. Yeah, but comics are very, one thing about comics, they're very, very close knit now in clicks. <laughs> <laughs> but then they click, they're very close knit. And if you can get two clicks sitting close to each other, you might get a merge. Never know. But, um, but I think, though, but comedians, I think by and large, support each other. I think overall, honestly, from the days when I started doing stand up, that overall, I think comedians, support each other there was rivalries and there was all that kind of stuff and look i was in the center of a lot of them myself you know you get older and then you get wiser and you realize you know you you should have been more of each other you know helping build each other up and not tearing each other down but i think overall the comedians care about other comedians so Mm -hmm. yeah the joke goes is that uh uh the day a comic dies uh the 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 for first question, other comics actors. Where, where, where was he booked next week? <laughs> <laughs> Headline: Well, I'm only an MC, but uh, I'll borrow some material. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, uh, the the days of the comedy cottage, from from what I heard, is when it was in its heyday. You used to have to book. Uh, if you wanted to see the show, you would have to make reservations two weeks in advance. Because they would they would they would sell out that solidly. Well, see, you know, I wasn't privy to all of that just because I was a new talent. Like I said, I, I worked the cottage less than a year, but it was eight months, and it was magical because you know I was part of that history of that club before it did turn into the last laugh. And once it did turn into the last laugh, it was not even close. It was it was it didn't resemble the comedy cottage whatsoever. Which was really odd because it was the exact same building, the exact same showroom, but the audiences were polar opposite. Terrible hmm. audiences for the last laugh. Hmm. And I, I should have included that clip of Steve Seagrin <laughs> talking about <laughs> Jay uh, Jay Burke, the uh, former manager. God bless his soul, he has passed away. Yeah, of the last laugh, naming it the last laugh because I got the last laugh. <laughs> last <Yeah>. laugh. <laughs> that do a really horrible Steve Seagrin. I mean, that do him justice. One of the funniest comics I've ever worked with or ever seen. But it's yeah. uh, the last time I worked for the last time I worked for Jay was in Chesterton, Indiana at the Waterbird Cafe, I believe, and that was all that he was booking at the time. That truly was the last, that was the last <laughs> laugh. Room. It was called something different, but do you know what was really significant about that room in Indiana, in Chesterton? Is It's where I met, and it's where I think he might have started, possibly, Craig Robinson. Huh. Craig Robinson was the permanent host there. Huh. That's where I met him all those years ago. Huh. Crazy. Yeah, and right away I knew he was going to be someone. Just like, I think I would say probably Craig Robinson and Hannibal Burris are the two comedians that I saw right away, and I knew they were going to be big. When I saw Hannibal, I knew he was going to be big. Yeah. Met him yeah. in 2008, and you could just tell. Yeah, me too. Me too. And uh, I think that about uh, that about wraps it up for the podcast segment. Uh, this has been Stand Up, Sit Down by guest today, Michael Alexander. I hope you enjoyed the show. We're here every Friday. Come back. Come back again. Good night, everybody. 